Welcome, everyone. I am delighted to introduce Miriam May, the CEO of Friends of the Arva Institute, which works to support the Arva Institute and recruit students and interns from the U.S. to study at the Institute. We are excited to have here today with us Dr. Ofer Margulit, Lecturer of Environmental Ethics at the Arva Institute for Environmental Studies. And with that, I give you Miriam. Welcome everyone, it's wonderful to be here with you and to uh, welcome new friends and old. The Environmental Institute is a leading environmental academic and research institute in the Middle East that houses accredited programs, research centers, and international cooperation initiatives focusing on a range of environmental concerns and challenges. Our work advances environmental cooperation in the face of political conflict. With a student body composed of Jordanians, Palestinians, Israelis, and participants from around the world, the Institute offers students an exceptional opportunity to learn from leading professionals like Dr. Margalit, performing friendships and developing skills that enable them to lead the region and the world in solving today's most pressing environmental challenges. Students at the Institute explore a range of environmental issues, from exceptional transboundary and interdisciplinary perspective under the guidance of leading environmental professionals and academics. Students take courses in both the natural and social environmental sciences, focusing on the areas of water management, renewable energy, ecology, sustainable agriculture, environmental politics, and more. At the Institute, the idea that nature knows no borders is more than a belief it is a fact, a curriculum, and a way of life. Today, we are here to explore environmental ethics, one of the classes offered in the fall semester. Have you ever wondered what a fairer environmental policy towards humans and the environment would look like? By exploring the basic assumptions that underlie human actions, is it possible to change our trajectory and take action to correct environmental injustices? Um, it is my pleasure to welcome, to introduce Dr. Ofer Margalit. Um, Dr. Margalit is a lecturer at the Institute and an alum of the Institute, of which we are very proud. That is our proudest thing. And he has worked in the field of education for over 20 years. He received his PhD in philosophy from Tel Aviv University, and his research focuses on the ethics of responsibility with an emphasis on the development of personal responsibility in times of broader crisis. He holds an MA in Jewish thought from Tel Aviv University in conjunction with the Hartman Institute, where he was a Malamdim fellow and a BA in classics from Bar Ilan University. Dr. Margalit was a student at the Aravai Institute for, in 2005, an experience he says that Prout profoundly changed him and is also where he met his wife. Great side benefit. He grew up in a kibbutz in the center of Israel and now lives with his family in Jerusalem. With that, I turn it over to Ofer. Okay, so thank you for coming again. And uh, so my name is Ofer Margalit. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually an Arva alumni, 2005-06. Uh, so for me to coming back to the Arva, especially as a lecturer, it's, some, it's a very special uh, event, obviously. Um, uh, because uh, it was always a home for me since I was there. Um, just like Miriam mentioned, I, that's also where my life kind of took like a very special turn or a dramatic turn, I would say, by uh, that's where I met my uh, my wife and uh, we have now a wonderful family living in Jerusalem. So uh, anyway, for me, the Arava, it's a, it's a very special place and always nice to come back there and also to teach the next generation of the uh, Arva students. Um, so uh, what we're gonna do today, we're gonna talk a bit about uh, the course I'm teaching on the, on the first semester, which is environmental ethics. And uh, since we have a relatively short time to introduce this course, we'll just go over some basic stations. So I want you just to get the impression of what we're doing there with the students. It'll be like just a small taste of that. I'm gonna share the, um, I'm gonna share my um, screen with you. One second, let me do. See how you do it. Okay, can you see my screen right now? Yeah. Yes. Amazing. Okay, so this is us. 
whoever visited the kibbutz ever know the center, this is the Merkaz, that's where we have uh, most of our classes. Also, we have this very special tree. Um, we sit a lot outside and many of the discussion actually will take place not only in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom, um, you know, kind of like um, group discussions. Uh, so that's kind of a representative uh, picture. Um, so let's talk a bit about the environmental ethics. And uh, so just to get again, the notion of what we're doing there in the class. Um, so first of all, um, one second, why I don't see my, okay. okay. You see my, uh, my presentation now? Yeah. Yes. But if you can full screen it, that would be great. No, it's in full screen. No, it is. If you um, play the slideshow, I think then it will. Yeah. No, I see it as a full screen. Do you see that uh, this way or? It's... Um, we don't, um, uh, but it's, one I... second. so yeah, maybe I, mm. Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's, full, it's full screen for us. We can see full screen. Oh, oh, you see full screen. Okay, great, great. So you see the what is ethics and this picture taking from the movie. Someone recognize the movie? Titanic. Exactly. And thank you. And, and by the way, really feel free. Uh, I'll teach you just like how I teach my students. And it's very like, you know, if you have any question, uh, any comment, um, anything just you know feel very free to to enter and, and, and speak um so yeah that's kind of a scene from the titanic and and, and uh, who said the titanic now who was it sarah did you say that yes yeah so well, what's the scene we're seeing here can you describe it very shortly so i actually haven't seen the titanic but i i recognize the characters i think that this was uh, who gets on the lifeboats and how they choose who gets on the lifeboats and i think she was pretending um, to have a kid but i'm not sure Wow, Sarah, not bad for someone who haven't seen the movie. Um, yes, so uh, what we're seeing here is the, the villain, the bad guy in the movie. I forgot his name, but uh, he's not supposed to be on the on the lifeboat on the Titanic, which had only half of the capacity for the passenger once the, the, the ship had started to sink. Um, and he's basically taking a baby or a, a small child, and he's saying, like, this is my child, and I'm going to be on the uh, on the lifeboat which most of the audience will be very um, um, angry about this behavior. And so again, in the class, we're gonna go more in depth about what is ethics. We're gonna talk about different uh, paradigms of ethics, but here, just to resemble this question, we're gonna see a, a, a scenario that is, is instinctively almost like kind of clicking to our ethical thinking. And, 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 um, and, and first of all, we're, we have kind of a judgment and then why we have this kind of judgment. And what is wrong with what, what this uh, person do, the, obviously the actor, but I mean, in real life also we have uh, many examples. Um, so why, wh wh what's the reason for our uh, kind of uh, negative judgment towards this situation or to positive judgment? Um, what's the origin of such a judgment? And, and this kind of question would be, uh, I would say kind of the corpus of the ethical arena. Um, uh, yeah, so, this is where one uh, one thing we're gonna speak in class. Something wrong. Okay. Um, so uh, the first topic and maybe the, the the main topic in environmental ethics in the Arava will be uh, this dichotomy the dichotomy between um, anthropocentrism and ecocentrism, which means the human in the center or or, or uh, the ecology is in the center. And um, the main assumption here that our culture is overall is under the heavy influence of anthropocentric thinking. And that's, we, we see that by different examples. For example, we're examining some of the, um, some of the, um, um, you know, the origin of our current, uh, of uh, cultural values and, uh, we're dealing, for example, with uh, the origin according to uh, the monotheistic uh, religion, uh, according to especially the Bible and the, the first chapter of the Bible, and which I'm sure some of you probably gave it a thought about how anthropocentric might you can read the, the Bible, which God basically give uh, prioritization to, to, to men over other nature. Um, 
mostly in the first chapter. In the second chapter of the of Genesis, it will be a bit different. But uh, so that's something to to think about um, about the origin. Why we have such anthropocentric anthropocentric uh, uh, culture? Um, and when I said when I'm saying anthropocentric culture. Uh, we're examining that through a different uh, case study. For example, it would be about, uh, that's kind of a very, uh, I would say local example from the Arava and the Red Sea area of, uh, of the preservation of the corals. So one side will see there are human needs, on the other side we'll see there are uh, more ecological needs. And usually, especially that's what was going on in the Arava, but in, in, in a lot, but, uh, Many other places in the world, usually the human needs will take priority priority over the uh, ecological needs. Uh, that's one of the reasons reason why we have such a deterioration in the, the situation of the corals, for example, in the Red Sea, in the Bay of Elat, especially. Um, very famous and central topic in environmental ethics is the it's the uh, animal rights and. Uh, Focusing mostly about uh, eating animals, which is, I would say, that's kind of the the most, uh, <laughs> I would say, the the, the most uh, cruel example you can find of how we are using animals, how we are basically having this anthropocentric um, uh, approach is so uh, enrooted in our in our nature that we are allowed to or feel allowed that we. are able to, to eat animals and, and to, to use animals as food. Um, we're actually in class, we will make like a debate between uh, uh, carnivores, people who are eating meat, people who are uh, uh, vegans. And uh, that's uh, something very interesting. The students usually um, find it uh, also very relevant for their life. Um, another uh, topic would be animal testing. Uh, here we bring uh, Peter Singer, the and uh, mostly as kind of the main reading in this uh, part of the He's course. The I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> Just what, what we said uh, very briefly is about um, the anthropocentric versus the uh, ecocentric um, and notions. Uh, here we read the, the Aldo Leopold, the, the Sun County Almanac, um, especially the, the land ethics. Um, it's kind of a represent, representative text for uh, ecocentric, and and I and I spoke a bit about the the um, origin for for so, uh, for, for anthropocentric sorry uh, values in the uh, monotheistic uh, religions, and I spoke. And now you see my my slides. Okay, yeah, you see the human needs ver uh, versus the pres uh, preservation of biodiversity. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so I, I just gave us a, a case study that we're, we're learning is in class about. Um, just to, to to see very clearly how usually we would prefer the the, the human needs over the uh, the biological the ecological uh, needs um and then i spoke about uh, eating animals about uh, animal rights uh, here the main text would be uh, peter singer uh, animal liberation but um we're reading different uh, things here in this part of the course uh, we're talking about uh, testing in animals, another clear example of how we're um, prioritizing humans over, uh, over animals. Um, somebody maybe want to just uh, join to the class now and just say, I mean, how animal testing would be kind of an example for um, anthropocentric approach. Well, I think there might be a difference in whether you're testing perfume and makeup or medicines. Is there mm -hmm. a dichotomy there in terms of using animals as a way through? I'm just making that up. I'm just. Yeah, I mean, we're using animals also for perfume and, and different hygiene uh, uh, products, obviously. But overall, I'm asking about uh, using animals before we're using a uh, uh, humans uh, in any product or especially in every medicine that we're having. And uh, what is that contraption? It looks like a torture chair. Yeah. So this is able. It's it's a it's a wrist monkey, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it, it was uh, it's a she uh, wrist monkey. She was a part of the uh, space program in the uh, early '60s, part of the Apollo mission uh, to the moon. Uh, so obviously they were sending first animals. Before they were sending humans to to space, just to see how uh, 
you know, uh, obviously the 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 the, the, the environment uh, uh, outside the atmosphere uh, might affect uh, any organism. Um, so that that's uh, one kind of example of uh, of testing animals. There are many others. Um, but anyway, where we always we we usually would prefer uh, of, uh, taking animals uh, uh, just for uh, uh, safety uh, measure and before we take any uh, humans. And I, I'm just saying uh, this is something very uh, much rooted in our the way we think. Obviously, we'll take animals um, during the COVID pandemic. Now, um, each uh, each company that uh, came with a vaccine now, uh, um, Moderna, Pfizer. Uh, Thousands of animals went through different kind of testing just to um, be able for us to have the vaccine uh, finally. So it happens every day. It happens obviously uh, for many years now. Um, so that's another example again to 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 see how we're very much rooted in our uh, anthropocentric kind of thinking, and that's another example we're working with uh, in, in class. Um, Another, how, how much time do I have, Sarah? Can you give me some? Uh, um, you can go 10, 15 more minutes. Okay, so let me go a bit faster just for you again to get kind of an overview of the class without getting too much into details here. Um, so you see that it says now a uh, case study three? Yes. So here it's another, it's a kind of a subtopic inside the animal rights, and it's about some animals we would prefer more than other animals. So obviously we don't, we, we, we care for animal in a different ways, I would say. Um, so for example, here you can see the, the lion uh, Cecil, you know Cecil the lion, you heard of him? It's, uh, it was uh, the king of the savannah in, in Zimbabwe um for me from 2002 i think 2015 if i'm not mistaken that it was key he was killed by these two guys on the bottom um two hunters that went for a hunting tour um and they're um they also uploaded their uh, pictures on uh um in the social media just to show off uh, about their hunt and they show the the lion that they hunted and then obviously it creates a lot of like uh unrest in the uh, social uh, media arena um, among animal uh, rights uh, movements and, uh, and just common people just saying, how dare they uh, killing uh, Cecil the lion, the king of the lion. And after a few words, um, some other voices were heard about, why are we caring so much about one lion as noble as animal as it might be? But why we don't care for all these other animals that are being uh, killed, slaughtered every day, every minute, uh, all around the world? Why? Why we care for some animal more than we care for other animal? Um, uh, here we we read the Melanie Joy book from 2010 about basically the reason why we prioritize some animals over the others. And she put it to, to really cultural reason, not from any other reason. So sometimes people think that some animals are really are value more than others, or some people, some animals will be more likely to be eaten from all kind of an inherent reason. So she's basically in her book show that it's completely based on uh, on, a, on a cultural bias. For example, in a, in a specific areas in the Far East, dogs would be food. <laughs> Well, uh, cows will be sacred animals. Um, While well, in the, the Western countries, <clears throat> in the Western Hemisphere, usually it will be the, the opposite. So that's kind of a, another topic in a, in a, um, the anthropocentric, ecocentric kind of a dichotomy. Um, um, other topics we are dealing with in uh, wait one second, I need to admit in uh, environmental ethics, we'll deal with the uh, social ecology. Mostly we read the uh, Mori Bokchin book about basically what he says in a very general way is that we will never be able to solve the environmental issue we have unless we, uh, before we solve our uh, social issues that we have. And he's using all kind of Marxist uh, theories uh, in his books just to explain uh, a notion of hierarchy, of, uh, of power structure, of domination, which we take from nature and we, uh, which we take from humans between themselves, and we also apply it into the natural arena. Um, 
So it's kind of a different perspective to, to, to look at the environmental crisis. Uh, he explained by that, for example, a rivalry between uh, different countries, uh, what we see today in Ukraine. Uh, um, you see how each, he shows how each uh, uh, government, how each country is basically very self-egoistic in its own needs. And that's kind of a, um, kind of a very serious obstacle for any ability to able, ever, ever be able to um, a rich kind of a sustainable solution for our, uh, I would say, environmental, but also human uh, uh, future, uh, the future for the human race. Um, and also it speaks about, uh, obviously, about uh, different classes among humans, between uh, societies, between uh, different countries, rich, poor countries, and etc. So that's kind of taking uh, kind of a taking the conversation from environmental, anthropocentric, by ecocentric to a more like social, um discussion uh, here we speak also about why it's so hard to uh to uh solve the uh the uh the climate crisis we're all uh having today in israel we just had now in june the third uh storm lightning storm uh, <laughs> uh the, the you know everybody is really in shock here about the, how the, the the climate is getting crazy and, and i think it's not just here obviously it's everywhere we, we feel something is very different. And according to scientists, obviously, uh, we should experience uh, and expect more of that to come in the future in even a harsher condition. And the question here is, if we know that there is, I would also make it like as an allegory, as a, as a train coming towards us and we are on the track, why we're not moving? <laughs> and that's a question also Stephen Gardner in his book uh, about the, the perfect moral storm, he asked, I mean, why? Are we not able to change our behavior, even though we know that there's a crisis very much uh, accepted by most uh, scientific communities is, is, is coming uh, upon us? Maybe not in our generation. We might be able to kind of uh, maybe go through a kind of a still normal uh, climate um, uh, situation, say. but, but, but the, the future generation for sure. So why? And they give different reasons. And it's very interesting to, to go over that. And, just to see how this crisis, which you call perfect moral stones, it's a, it's a, it's a moral stone that's very hard to solve. Uh, there is a reason why government as individuals find very hard to, to, to take action. Uh, anyway, um, so that would be one reason that the last topic we're dealing in, uh, one of the big topic where the, one of the three to big topics we're dealing in environmental ethics will deal with technology. Hopes and concerns, you know, the, there is the always the notion of kind of a technology will solve everything. Um, we call it the optimi technological optimism. Uh, technology will solve the hunger. Technology will, will, will solve all the problems of, uh, of health issue we have, the diseases, the uh, everything will be solved by technology. Also climate change, there is a technological uh, <laughs> solution. <laughs> Uh, or scientists, according to science, or kind of like uh, climate engineering. Uh, so there, there's kind of this notion, but in the same time, we know that technology can take a very negative or I would say a harmful term, turn. Um, and that, that's another thing we'll talk in class about, uh, mostly about AI. Uh, uh, today, it's, it's, it's very much in the news. Uh, also, genetic engineering. Um, and the last topic, which is also my favorite, uh, which I dedicate for this mostly one class or two depends on the how many weeks we have in each semester it will be the ethics of responsibility which is something very close to my heart also my phd was dealing with this uh, notion uh, my phd it was after the holocaust but here i just made some adaptation and uh it's going to be like uh, in the environmental uh, uh, concept and uh again the main concept here just giving you the titles here it's about how we care more for what is close to us and we care less for what is far from us, which we call the kind of the circles of responsibility. Um, maybe a very good example and very famous example would be how we really pay very little uh, attention to, to, to the future generations. Uh, um, I mean, Paul Ehrlich here in the book on the right, he spoke about the, already about the, you know, the, how we should really start to maybe try to, to limit the population on Earth as one of the main cause for for um, for the depletion of resources, but but overall we are just very much concerned about the immediate and much less about 
the non-immediate, the distant, the hidden. We care more so much for our very close circles of people, family, obviously, friends, maybe the nation, maybe the religion, but much less for the other. And that's kind of a psychological um, uh, reason, very much enrooted in our in our uh, in our mentality. And and, uh, and and we're trying to examine different ways to maybe to to, to kind of uh, break this mentality. Um, we're talking here about some ecofeminist uh, theories and about some Buddhist and, and mindful theories that are trying to basically what they're trying to do, which is kind of the general thing is to to really uh, dismantle this uh, um, these circles and, and to try to to make the distant also feel as the immediate and and try to um, help people a bit, uh, increase their circle of responsibility uh, beyond their immediate. And for this audience, I thought it would be nice to bring this kind of Talmudic tale, which some of you, I believe, might know. Somebody want to read it, and with this, we're going to end. I think that's the last, yeah, that's the last uh, slide. Uh, somebody want to read it and maybe try to interpret it? It's a bit Talmudic, I'm warning you, but uh, it's a very nice tale which I like very much. Um, somebody you want to go for it? Yeah, guys, don't be shy. Really, let's try to study together here. Don't, don't uh, feel an embarrassed. Everything is okay. We're not, we're not well, judgmental. We, we have to call on someone? Um, okay, let me take this. Okay, Avram. Yes, thank it you. It happened once that one removed stones from his own premises to public ground. Right. And a virtuous one passing by at the time and seeing him do that said to him, you evil man, why do you remove stones from premises not belonging to you to your own premises? The man <laughs> laughed at him. Sometime later, he was compelled to sell his lands and while walking on the public highway in front of his former lands, he stumbled over the stones he once piled up there. He then exclaimed, I see now that the virtuous one was right in what he said to me. Wow. Uh, can, I, can I bring you to my class to read it this way? <laughs> I, I did some mild editing sorry no, no, um, great. But, really great. Yeah. but the, yeah. the the message of this passage and mm -hmm. i was well aware of it before um mm -hmm. is that uh, we sort of harp on ownership and our misunderstanding the nature of the the relationship that we have with the uh, with nature and the world. The one thing that we really own is not those things that we hoard, but the world around us. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, this so is yeah. Bob. I want to say, I believe there was a translation error in your to the English. I oh, believe yeah? I should say, uh -huh. you evil, why don't you remove stones from premises not belonging to you? So, you know, think through what lesson we want the guy to know years later. Wait, wait, say again, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. Uh, you know, hang on, I'm gonna say, we're gonna go on to questions, thank you. Let's not go too okay. topic on us here. Uh, okay. Yeah, but- Where Do you have a um, final thing you'd like to say, please, before we go to questions? Yeah, thank I would you. just like to say that this, uh, um, and this story, this Talmudic story from the Baba Kama, um, just resemble, I think, what I, try, I was trying to say in the, in the last thing, in the last uh, topic of the environmental ethics, it's about responsibility, about being able to see beyond yourself, uh, which is something that, as a, also an educator, as a teacher for many years, that's something I see as kind of a highly, a highly uh, goal, uh, a very important goal that I have. Um, to help students to understand, because I really believe in education as kind of a tool for also a help with the environmental crisis. Um, yeah, um, yeah. No, I think we'll, we're, we'll take a break now to stop the share now. To stop sharing, that, that's, that's... Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, and I'll, okay. Hi. I'll spotlight <laughs> Miriam and she might take the first few questions. All 
Pam, Miriam, you're, you're, you're muted, Miriam. Miriam. Okay, great. Hi, thank you so much, Ofer, and for giving us that quick insight into um, what we're what you teach. I kind of have a question of my own, which I think is echoed by some of our our questioners. You know, one of the challenges that I see is between the ethical broad and the personal. And you you talked about that in the, the circles, how close it is to our um, existence. You know, um, the the balance between I do I want to recycle and I also want to fly across the country to see my grandchildren. Whatever it is, those um, ethical quandaries that have environmental impact are. How do how do we as individuals work on balancing the things we want to do and the things we should do? And you know, people talk about carbon footprint and all the rest. How does that all kind of play out? How do your students think about that? That's a very good question. I think the word balancing here will be the, the right one. We we we, we cannot uh, um, um, have goals that we cannot stand for because otherwise it will create kind of frustration. So I mean, my students and also myself, you know, we, we, there there is no one standards. Obviously, we all want to say, put it simply, save the world. But in the on the other hand, we have life and we have needs. And uh, obviously, once you have kids, I know uh, it's it's really hard to become environmentalist or to maintain environmentalism. It's possible, but uh, but it might be more challenging than just. Um, you know, before uh, I would say I had family, which it's, it was kind of uh, easier. Uh, that's how I found. So, so it's true. Um, um, so I think uh, the, the right word will be to try to have it in the awareness, to be aware of what you do. We have, for example, a class about uh, shopping, about co uh, consumerism. And uh, obviously, you know, that's kind of a big topic today. Environmentalism about, you know, the, for example, the circle of the, of our, from the cloth we're buying, where they're coming from um what the process they're going through who was the company we're buying from so these kind of things can be um first of all to have in the awareness to try to be a more aware people and to try to do a more of our mental choices uh, and, and and again without too much of uh we try to try to be an absolute uh environmentalist because i think that will create more frustration so just just to try um how do you, how do you that's, a, that's, that's just my message from the students how do you find that your students who come from very different places, from Jordan, Palestine, the US, uh, around the world, uh, and Israeli Jews, how do you find that they think about this or they think about it differently because of those backgrounds? That's a very good point. Um, here in the Middle East, there is a notion, also maybe in the States, but there is a notion that environmental, environmentalism is kind of a privilege. It's for privileged people. <laughs> we have like existential issues we are dealing here with. We're dealing here with, uh, uh, you know, uh, just going through life, uh, make sure, you know, we're gonna survive for the next year or two. Uh, uh, the, the immediate here in the Middle East, it's, 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 it's very strong. So many times, even the, 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 the students that we'll have here will be people that study something very practical for their life. Um, it's not a secret that many of the students coming to Arava are not just because there's so much about the environment. It's true. They're also about the environment, but also because many of them see it kind of a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a place where they can develop themselves into the next stage academically or uh, um, even economically in a way. So in this sense, I think uh, many of the students from the from Israeli, Palestinians, Jordanian um, are coming with... Uh, some kind of which you call a really immediate sense of, of, of life, which the environment, uh, you know, taking care of the environment or being able to be environmentalist, it's uh, something that is not obvious. Um, so, in the Ava, obviously, you're getting a, a lot of information, a lot of tools also, and, and, and much more like a sense of like you want to be involved in, uh, in this struggle. Um, and I want to believe uh, that, you know, you go out of there after a year or one semester when you're more, um, you're doing, you, you're doing better than the, the way you, you came in. That, that's what I want to say. But there is never an absolute situation, at least for most of us. I mean, I'm talking of people trying to just live normally, not uh, living uh, completely in nature or in different things, which some, some alumni are like that, you know, decided to go and uh, live, living completely 
zero waste, for example, things like there are, but most of the students are not. And anyway, so I hope I answered your question. But. And does that affect the, I presume the conversation in the room, where they come from and how they, how they hope to implement it? Um, we had a couple of people ask a question, I think, uh, framed in different ways um, yeah. about a climate change and sort of the, the fiscal reality of uh, how that affects us. Uh, until there are deep implications for, for climate change that people feel, will policy, will their behaviors change? Uh, we in the Northeast of the United States just had the results of Canadian wildfires. I saw the pictures. never told me that we would be sitting indoors kind of waiting for Canadian smoke because the whole neighborhood smelled like a barbecue and the air quality was in the 400s, which is not good. Um, to pass, I would have said, that sounds ridiculous, but this is climate change in real time. This is people losing income, health issues, et cetera, as a result of climate change. And what, what is it gonna take? What's that tipping point that's going to get people to move people from just, um, oh yeah, we should probably do something about climate change, to having those, the financial personal implications that will make them. I, I know a couple of you have asked this, Bernard um, and um, others, Brenda, there are people who've asked this uh, in our chat. So I'm kind of putting those together. Yeah, I, I think the pessimistic rule would be that humans are, are driving, driven into action only when you know there's a sword on their neck, so to speak. Um, some people give the example of uh, two world wars during the 20th century, that uh, the ones like the EU and the democracies in the, and, uh, and the smeddling maybe of the, the, the European uh, uh, empires without having two very devastating uh, world wars. So some people would say philosophy would, would have this approach. I mean, I, I belong to the philosopher that believe that education, I'm, I'm a big believer in education, I have to say. Um, but it's, it's, it's also a very uh, a, a long and uh, specific uh, struggle. Um, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, today the students I see are more pessimistic than we were in 2005. So I think we're seeing more the implications. Like in 2005, six, we just spoke about glo uh, global warming. I think Al Gore's movie, the, Inconvenient Truth, I think that was the name of the movie, just came out, if I'm not mistaken. And that's kind of brought the uh, climate change into, uh, um, into the headlines. And, 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 and it was just something to, that will happen. But today I feel like students do feel like it's, it's actually happening. And uh, there's also a sense, I think, in the, among, uh, you know, the, uh, like in, in different, in different uh, arenas, also the, the, the political arena between the, uh, you know, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, the students today are more pessimistic, I would say. That's that's what my feeling. Uh, and that makes our, our work as educators even harder. Um, but there's a lot of also amazing things that's happening that gives a lot of hope. So, you know, it's, uh, I, you have to maintain some kind of hope here in this situation. Um, and I hope you won't get to the point where we really, pay a higher uh, price for neglecting the, for example, the, yeah, the climate issue. So I just spent the last uh, three or four days with uh, Dr. Tarek Abu Hamid, who's the executive director of the Aravai Institute. He was here for our um, annual meeting and some uh, follow on. And uh, he, he mentioned he, he is often invited to uh, UN um, programs. We were on a UN council. He represents Israel at many of these things, at COP meetings, at N7 meetings, etc. And he said one of the issues that arises is that the developing world is more the, how can I say, gets the result of climate change and the developed world has made climate change the problem. And that dichotomy of who creates the issue and who suffers from it and the refugee crisis. And in fact, the Syrian civil war was the first 
environmental drought civil war. And the refugees are still uh, in, in Jordan, in our world, if affecting peace. If, you know, nobody, it's not a bubble. So how does that kind of um, reality, is that the kind of thing that also is in the, the near, the circles, what is near me, what is far from me? Do we care about the other in this uh, field? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, that's a good question. I think if you look at the, in the, uh, you know, just in the local politics here in Israel, I mean, I would say, Israel is very much a, you know, this phrase, the, the poor people of your city are, are have prioritization. I think that's very much a, a leading any, uh, um, I would say, political uh, decisions in, in almost in every country. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean that's I, th I think what we see today is it's a, again it's like I said with the Mori Bookchin when we spoke about it, the social ecology it's 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 it's, it's this tendency for for each uh, each country each states to be very much closing to all very uh, uh, selfish interests. Um, we judge the world also in a very limited uh, point of view because of that because also the, the education for example is uh, is very much um, narrowing us to. So a certain uh, way of thinking, and um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really it's a multi-system problem here that, that we need to to approach. And yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think we see it in different ways. Um, but did I answer your question, or maybe I missed something in your question? I think I think you know. Well, if you could quickly answer my question, the world would be a better place indeed. I think we need to all learn more, do more and understand more. And I think the Arava Institute is such an important force, not just in um, that we teach our students, but that our students take this knowledge home. They take it to their futures and their careers. Uh, we have an alumni network of 1800 plus around the world. Uh, if each of them are influencing, and we know they are because here they are teaching uh, like uh, Ofer is, in the world and spreading um, knowledge and understanding, but we're also working on a cross-border basis and around the world to sort of spread this understanding of environmental um, justice, envir climate change, and what we need to do. We very much appreciate you all have been there. Many of you have put interesting comments, responses. There's been a little Talmudic back and forth. Um, uh, into the chat, and we will share it all with Ofer. It is not uh, going away. Uh, we thank you all very much for participating and joining us. Uh, if you have further questions, um, yes, you will get a recording of the Zoom class, and also there are other uh, opportunities. Uh, if you have children or grandchildren who should be coming to the Arava Institute as students or interns, we are never too busy for your referrals. Um, we are the primary mm -hmm. support of the Arava Institute here at the Friends. Um, if you're not on mute, you speak. And um, we appreciate your support and your friendship. And um, thank you very, uh, very much. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, and uh, hope to thank see you in the Israel. Yes, thank now you. I, now I feel a little more secure about what I know about environmental ethics, and boy, I kind of would love to sit in on, wouldn't we all like to have the, the opportunity to sit in on the class? Yeah, like? yes, yeah, I mean, obviously. Now we've gotten a taste, now we only want more. Thank yes, you very thank much. Thank you for hosting here, and uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being all part right. of the class community. The wonderful family. It's an amazing family. Doing so much good in the world. Okay.